नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय I started this uh, series of talks of which today's should be the last in this particular series by reading uh, Shrimad Bhagavad Gita as it is uh, chapter 16 text 8 with Shila Prabhupada's translation and commentary I'll just read the uh, verse again Asatyam apratishtam te jagad ahur anishvaram aparaspara sambhutam kimanyat kama haitukam they meaning the demons they say that this world is unreal with no foundation no god in control they say it is produced of sex desire and has no cause other than lust text 9 following after this etang drishtim avashtabhya nashtat mano pabuddhaya prabhavant yoga karmana shayayo jagato hitaha following such conclusions the demoniac who are lost to themselves and who have no intelligence engage in unbeneficial horrible works meant to destroy this world in the purport shrila prabhupad states i'm not going to read the whole purport i just one quote which is particularly relevant to the discussion of scientism uh shil prabhupad writes such people are considered the enemies of the world because ultimately they will invent or create something which will bring destruction to all indirectly this verse anticipates the invention of nuclear weapons of which the whole world is today very proud at any moment war may take place and these atomic weapons may create havoc such things are created solely for the destruction of the world and this is indicated here due to godlessness such weapons are invented in human society they are not meant for the peace and prosperity of the world yeah so modern weapons are a result of science and scientists will say well that it, it's just technology and how you use it that's nothing to do with science but what else do you use nuclear weapons for <laughs> and for killing people so they're developed by scientists who know that they are meant for mass killing of people I, it's so hypocritical that they these countries they talk about war what is it war criminals what about dropping atomic bombs how about that for war crime they maybe they have they say well it would have saved many more lives okay they drop one and then another so many uh then no intelligence alpha buddha little intelligence those scientists are in many ways very intelligent shila prabhupada recognizes that also in his purport to the uh famous uh verse namang dushurino murha prapadyante naradhamaha maya paritagana asurum bhavam ashritaha this verse classes four different kinds of demons one and murha the foolish another class maya paritagana means their intelligence but their real intelligence is covered by maya so in some ways they're very intelligent but in other ways they're not very intelligent because well that some clue of that is given in the next verse verse 10 kamam ashrita dushpuram dambhamana madan vitaha mohad grihit vasad grahan pravartante shuchivrataha 
taking shelter of insatiable lust and absorbed in the conceit of pride and false prestige, the demoniac thus illusioned are always sworn to unclean work, attracted by the impermanent. Attracted by the impermanent, they're fascinated by this world, in which everything is impermanent. That is one of the uh, two main characteristics of this material situation, which Lord Krishna mentions in Bhagavad Gita, Ashashvatam. Everything here is temporary. But they're attracted by it. Demons are attracted by this world. They, they think it's... First of all, they think that's all that there is. But a spiritualist, by definition, is not very interested in this world. But a materialist is... It's difficult to say very interested in this world because they're just totally absorbed in it. It's, they can't imagine anything beyond it. Absorbed in the conceit of pride. They're so proud. They think, we, we will, uh, by science, we will make a better world. We will, we will manipulate nature in various ways. Uh, that by our theories, we've understood there's no need for God. This is the demoniac outlook. Uh, of course, they'll say, well, what's this, some scripture? Some, something, something written a long time ago. They presume that everything in the past is, must be inferior. The idea of human progression. So everything in the past must be inferior. But interestingly, uh, more and more people in the West are adopting the ancient outlook which was uh, prominent in India and China and and uh, the cultures of neighboring countries that everything old is good. Whatever, whatever the ancients have given, that must be right because uh, we follow them. The understanding that they already understood, we just have to follow. And in the Western countries, that's coming more and more. There's this interest in ancient wisdom. I was just told that in Slovenia, there's a preaching program of of uh, going into different towns, renting a hall and advertising a program, Ancient Wisdom of the East. In the idea of uh, ancient wisdom cultures. The people in the past, they, yeah, they actually knew some very important things. So, uh, Bhagavad Gita, actually, uh, if we say it's a scripture, we should be a little careful about that because scripture, if, if that means it becomes equated with the Bible or the Quran, actually, the whole approach of the, in the cultures in which the Bible and the Quran are central, namely, well, the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Their main tenet is just to believe. This came from God, you have to believe it. But Krishna's approach in Bhagavad Gita is completely different. His approach is to give knowledge. This, the world is like this. Do you understand? Arjuna said, no. Jesus said, again, explain. Do you understand? No. Do you understand? No, no. And then Arjuna eventually understood. It's a Srimad Bhagavad Gita Upanishadsu Brahma Vidyayang Yoga Shastra Sri Krishna Arjuna Sangvade Arjuna Vishade Yoga Pratamadhyaya Every, uh, chapter of the Gita is traditionally, I don't know where the tradition came from, I, I suspect it may have come from Shankaracharya, one of his followers. Uh, at the end of every chapter, the, the name of the chapter is given. I just gave the name of the first chapter. So, so it is Srimad Bhagavad Gita. This is Srimad Bhagavad Upanishad. An Upanishad. Upanishads are the Jnana Kanda of the Vedas. Upanishads. Brahma Vidyaya, knowledge of the absolute truth. Uh, yoga Shastra, it's, it's a Shastra of Yoga, 
deals with yoga. Bhagavad Gita deals with karma yoga, jnana yoga, ashtanga yoga, bhakti yoga. And of course, establishing ultimately the superiority of bhakti yoga. But yoga understood as linking with the Supreme. In the conversation, Sri Krishna, Arjuna, Sangvade, in the conversation between Krishna, Sri Krishna and Arjuna. And then the name of each chapter, the first chapter, Arjuna, Vishada, Yoga. Each chapter's name is given as yoga. So the first chapter is the yoga of Arjuna's lamentation. Uh, so uh, Bhagavad Gita is spoken by Bhagavan. That's the very meaning. As Srila Prabhupada points out in the first uh, utterance of Krishna, actually in the Bhagavad Gita, in the first chapter, there's also Pashaitan uh, Panduputra Nama. No, what is that? Uh, that uh, Krishna... Uh, no, 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 I'm getting this. Up. But uh, Krishna speaks to Arjuna, but it's not Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita begins with Krishna giving instruction to Arjuna. So the first time, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Srila Prabhupada points out what is the meaning of Bhagavan. And elsewhere he points out that Vyasadev could have written Sri Krishna Uvacha, or so many names of Krishna are given in Bhagavad Gita itself by uh, Arjuna, by Sanjay, by Vyasadev, Tamuvacha, Hrishi, Kesha. Um, but particularly here, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, to stress, this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ultimate authority speaking. So what does it all come down to in the discussion of scientism? Should we believe the scientists or should we believe Krishna? and his representatives. Ultimately, of course, we may say this is circular reasoning, but it's very reasonable reasoning, <laughs> that the scientists who deny the existence of God, they're atheists, they're quite happy to say they're atheists, and in uh, Srila Prabhupada's use of the word, they are demons, asuras. They're people who do not have good intentions, although they may... Uh, purport themselves to have good intentions, or they, they may themselves consider themselves to have good intentions. Herr Hitler, he thought he had good intentions, doing, and, and millions of people also say, yeah, it's, this, is, this is great, this is what we need. It sort out all the problems of our country. This is the way to go. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, who do we trust? We have to follow someone. Someone, who say, someone may say, well, I don't follow anyone. I just make my own choice. But the choices we make are influenced by others. Even to say that, I make my own choice, is not original, it's not an original idea. The idea that everyone should have their own individual free choice, that's come up from various philosophers, Sartre, and I mean, before him, others also. Uh, the idea, we should just, everyone should be free to think what they like, do what they like, say what they like. Uh, we, we cannot but be influenced by others. It's, it's not, we don't live in a vacuum, either physical or psychological or educational. We all follow others. We're all, even any scientist, he builds any scientist, whatever discoveries they make, they build on the discoveries of others. Isaac Newton was wise enough to admit this. He said, whatever, if I can see further from other, than others, he said, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of great persons who have come before me. Uh, so where do we put our faith? Ultimately, we have to put a... We can take an agnostic path of not putting our faith anywhere. Or we can put faith in scientists who propose that there is no God. Or we can put our faith in... There are so many people who are 
trying to get our faith, uh, we have put our faith in Krishna. And it's very reasonable. This, this idea of being reasonable is also uh, very much a Western concept to emphasize that everything should be very reasonable. Uh, but we find that what Krishna speaks and what the Acharyas speak, it satisfies the intelligence and the soul. It's not cheating. Who should we trust? Should we trust Srila Prabhupada, who's a perfect character? Or should we trust perfect character, perfect knowledge, perfect devotion? Or should we trust someone who really doesn't have any idea of the purpose of life and who says that, well, really, what is it? What is the purpose of life? Anyway, we're just all chemicals. What is this purpose of life? So we put our faith in Srila Prabhupada and he himself didn't emphasize that you should just put your faith in me just because, well, I'm here. I'm here, folks. Here I am. Uh, but th this is personal cultism that, well, here I, I, I smile with a big smile and I, uh, I'm charismatic and dress in flamboyantly and uh, I'm expert in speaking in such a manner that people sometimes laugh and sometimes cry, can manipulate an audience. And Srila Prabhupada wasn't like that. Srila Prabhupada's speaking style was not, it wasn't what you'd call a magnetic, charismatic style. He, he would, breaking all the laws of public speaking, Srila Prabhupada would usually sit with his eyes closed while lecturing, concentrating. That's maybe the first thing they tell you in, I don't know, I haven't been to such a course, but, but uh, keep eye, keep eye contact with the audience and make sure you. <laughs> but Srila Prabhupada didn't do that at all and he didn't, he didn't sometimes raise his voice and sometimes lower it and tell a shlok, tell a joke, tell a shlok and all this. How to give a class. Tell a joke, tell a shlok, tell a story and tell a, Say something from Prabhupada, and uh, that's your. Well. But Srila Prabhupada didn't have any uh, charismatic style, which is, he wasn't out to impress others in a cheap way. So who do who should we trust? Should we trust Srila Prabhupada and the great Acharyas and the ancient knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, which it is really knowledge. Uh, it, it teaches us that which science will never be able to teach us because it is spiritual. And s material science, by definition, is material. They're very claim that, well, there's no soul, we didn't see any soul, we didn't, there's no God, we didn't see any God. But by definition, the soul is spiritual. God is spiritual, which means, means it's of a different nature to that of matter. So that means you're never going to be able to find it out by any material means. Then why did Srila Prabhupada call Krishna consciousness a science? It's a science in the sense that there's a methodology and if you follow it, it works. One can pratyakshavagamang dharmyam. One can directly experience it. The scientists may not be able to, they may be able to explain to some extent, why when people, some people, eat ice cream, they feel pleasure. Because, well, even the uh, companies like McDonald's, they've got it worked out. That they have to get the perfect combination of salt and sugar and fat. The, that's called the unholy trinity. Salt, sugar, and fat, all the things that are bad for you. We just get it in the right combination and people will come back and eat it again and again. It's like addictive because it tastes so good. So, uh, they've discovered that this gives pleasure and they can, 
they can maybe trace from the from the tongue and the palate up to the brain, which part of the brain it stimulates, but the actual experience of tasting and pleasure is not something which is explainable. Consciousness, isn't it? That is the nature of the soul. Where there is life, there is consciousness. So the message is a very good message. Um, Srila Prabhupada, he often noted that scientists, they're expert in speaking in uh, such convoluted language that no one can understand what it means and therefore people think they're very intelligent. So no doubt they have, un- they have uh, discovered many things, but w- when they boldly assert that, yes, yes, so now we've dis- science has discovered that there's no need to believe in any God because the universe came out, it just came out of a singularity and then it it came and, oh, there's the anthropic principle. That's a great one. Why are we here now in the bodily forms that we are and why are the trees there and the hills and the air and the atmosphere? Considering it's almost impossible, there are about 26 constants in the universe, Hubble's constants and gravitational constants and the weak force and the strong force, and the uh, so many different, which they all have to be exactly right, down to the nano, whatever you're measuring, for the universe to exist as it does now and for life to exist as we know it. And each one of them is extremely unlikely, 10 to the power of minus 26,000 or something like that. Practically impossible. And then when you get 26 of these all together, it becomes... mm, It's already mega impossible. It's impossible raised to the power of infinity. But, wait, folks, we've got the answer, the scientific answer. How is it possible that the... The, the universe as is as it is when it's so fine-tuned. It's called the anthropic principle, which means that, well, we're here now, and it couldn't have been any God, so it must, have, it must have happened like that, even though it's very unlikely, it must have happened like that because we're here to witness it. Very scientific. <laughs> In other words, we're here because we're here, and that's it. There's no explanation, but it's just good luck. Whoops, there's no such thing as luck. <laughs> In the, so the, practically the atheistic scientists saying, well, you should just trust us. We, we, we know what's going on. We can explain it all. And uh, indirectly they're saying that that all the great acharyas and everyone who's had a spiritual experience and communicated that to us, everyone, they're all just fools. And we're saying they're fools. So, who's intelligent and who's a fool? Uh, indirectly, they're saying, yes, Jesus was a fool, Buddha was a fool, Krishna, if he existed. I don't want to say it, it's blasphemy. But they, uh, they say there's no such thing as blasphemy. Because blasphemy. What is this idea of blasphemy? According to them, there is no such thing as blasphemy. You can say anything you like because there's nothing sacred. And they'll say, well, that's the simple, hard fact of life, that there's nothing beyond chemicals and waves of energies. There's nothing beyond that. Be- and how do they say that? Well, that's all that's observable. That's all that's... Uh, man is the measure of all things. So either they're fools or we are fools. Actually, from the scientific standpoint, you can't prove it either way because, like I say, they're dealing with matter. You can't, you can't prove the existence. Of, Show me God. Prove there's God. Well, yeah, we can prove. Take up the science of Bhakti Yoga and experience it. Just like if you want to prove 
that uh, light, what shall we say? Uh, prove that uh, water is made of a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. So what shall you do? Bring a telescope? It's a scientific instrument. Bring a telescope and prove it. You want to be scientific? Prove that Zagreb is the capital of Croatia. So bring out your Bunsen burner. Or maybe we need a prism. But even within science, for for specific functions, we need a specific methodology. We can't do. We can't study the cosmos at the cosmic level using a microscope, and we can't study microscopic organisms using a telescope. So, if we want to study the the, the nature of spirit, we have to adopt the correct methodology. But then, of course, you have to have some faith to begin with. If we, we say that, uh, well, look, uh, look under the microscope and you'll see some cells. You say, well, I don't believe any cells, so why should I look under the microscope? It's just some, something that you scientists talk about. Prove to me that there are cells. Okay, look under the microscope. Ah, why should I look under the microscope? Just because, why should I indulge in your stupid eye and maybe look under and see some cells? So he saw some, no, I just saw some things squiggling around. Well, they were cells. Ah, well, that's just what you say. It's just your scientific dogma. So in the same way, we can say, yes, there is God. We can prove the existence, but you have to follow the process. Now, why should I follow your process? It's just some religious dogma that they will say. <clears throat> so in this way, they're hypocritical. They have faith in their process. And they say, in scientific, that means it's proper. Well, we can say, well, we can also say, well, this is religious. Religion is higher than science. And then it's just um, one assertion against another. We either, Mahajano Yenagata Sapanta, we either accept Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and all the Acharyas and Srila Prabhupada as great personalities who can reveal to us the truth, or we accept Atheists, who uh, their vision does not go beyond matter, and they insist that it cannot go beyond matter, without any good grounds, actually. Just that uh, they insist, that's all. Uh, and they have various pleas, uh, as I, I went through them before. Previously, people believed in God when they didn't have any good scientific knowledge, but now there's no need to. As if they invented atheism. <laughs> Krishna is saying here in Bhagavad Gita, they're atheists. Even before there was your fancy science, they were atheists. It's nothing new that they invented. So, so many things. They would say that uh, previously people believed that disease was caused by sin, one result of the Black Plague in Europe, which was uh, far more devastating than uh, the World Wars. Even after World War One, far more people died in the one or two years afterwards from influenza than they did from the World War. So during the Black Plague, many people became very religious because they thought this was God's punishment on us. But now we know that all such things are caused by germs, although they can't say exactly which germs caused the Black Plague, things like na natural disasters and tsunamis. No, they're caused by natural things. Yeah, like, uh, for instance, all these nuclear tests which upset the Earth, and then there are more earthquakes. Uh, previously, people used to believe that God made the world, but now we know it's the Big Bang. Scientific. Previously, people used to believe that there were spirits and that we had souls, but now we know that from evolutionary theory that it's not true. And so on and so on and so on. They have their different theories, which they think are very up-to-date and scientific. But uh, we are given the charge by Srila Prabhupada to counter scientific atheism 
and to establish Bhagavad Tattva Vijnana, scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead. This is what we are supposed to be doing. Someone was asking me earlier today about Brahminical initiation with the idea that, well, if you're not Brahmin initiation, no one will want to if you no one want to marry you, but that's not the the Brahminical initiation is meant for well uh worshipping the deity, cooking for the deity, but especially for acquiring and distributing spiritual knowledge to counter the demoniac tendencies in human society. This is what Actually, the Brahminical initiation isn't even needed for that. Uh, but this, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Now in our movement, we have Kirtan Melas. We should, we should have Shiksha Melas. Ha! Intense instruction for devotees to go and preach Krishna consciousness. And we have to, counter this scientific, so-called scientific, proper, what's called scientific, this propaganda, atheism. Um, so the various uh, programs Srila Prabhupada gave us, one important factor is because it's presented that the West is triumphant with its science and all that we've discovered and everyone should follow Western culture by its scientific and materi materialistic outlook, here using the term materialistic in both the philosophical sense that there is nothing more than matter and the cultural sense that let's just enjoy this world. So uh, the Western world is definitely dominating. Western culture is accepted everywhere, uh, Increasingly, uh, all over the world, uh, the, the consumer culture, we'll find people are dressed in pretty much the same way in India and Korea and South Africa and America. It's uh, factory clothing. Uh, so one thing is important to show that ancient India had advanced knowledge even materially in uh, many fields, cosmography, metallurgy, anatomy, medicine, uh, gynecology, atomic science, weaponry, Brahmastra is described. Uh, so it's important to show that, and that the source is Shastra, which is revealed knowledge. Now, that's a great challenge because there are many uh, discoveries which scientists have given which appear to have no uh, parallel in Vedic knowledge. Now, of course, much of the Vedic knowledge is lost. That's one factor for various historical reasons. Uh, apparently, that such, such things as germs are described in Shastra. The, the word used in, if you're going to speak what is called Shud Hindi or pure Hindi, the word for germ is Anu, it's a scientific uh, Sanskrit word. But it, it may, it may say, probably Hindi speaking doctors among themselves, they just say germs. The English word is just incorporated. I'm sure it's the same in Croatian also. You just incorporate English words, probably more so in Indian languages. So, you say something like, uh, dolo, usme bahut germs hoga. Something like that. Wash his hands. There must be there must be many germs on them. Something that speak like that. Although 
Anu is the word, or, or for, for cell or for germs. But it appears that the, generally the concept of that is lost. But apparently, as uh, one of my disciples was doing some research, and or, he probably took it, he, he found out from others who are doing the research that if we look through even the extent uh, Shastric knowledge, much of which is actually still there, but just not much known, that all these concepts, germs and so many other things, are already there in the Vedic knowledge. Although the paramparas are lost, and so people don't know about it. So that's one very important thing to show that uh, knowledge of germs, electricity, that's a major factor in modern life. Was it known in in Vedic culture? Well, Srila Prabhupada translates, Natad Bhasayate Suryo, Nashashanko Napavaka. In the spiritual world, there is uh, no need of sun, or, there's no sun or moon or electricity. Of course, uh, we find descriptions in the spiritual world that there is a sun and the moon, so that means there's no material sun or moon, but certainly, uh, technological development based on electricity is not part of Vedic culture. Uh, Srila Prabhupada once said that one reason it wasn't uh, developed in that way is was people, one thing is that people had a more subtle technology. For instance, vimanas, airplanes, uh, there, well, there's a Sanskrit word, viman, the, the airline of Bangladesh uh, is called Bangladesh Biman. Viman means but in is uh, the Bengali pronunciation of but, so it's the same Sanskrit word uh, used for airline. So the extensive description, and there there is a shastra, extant shastra, which has recently been translated and published of different kinds of uh, airline air planes. Uh, and in Shastra, as described, Vimana Shastra. Um, and powered not simply by mantra, but by some mechanical means, but not gross, uh, not, gr- not kerosene and all that. Hmm? Hmm? With mercury, is it? Yeah. And, uh, well, getting a little speculative here, but even. Your friend Tesla, he had already invented um, means of just taking power from the atmosphere, which was killed by the Rothschilds because they wanted to sell the copper for the for the uh, wires. And so, uh, well, that's a great task to show that. In India, and actually throughout the world, and certainly was very developed in India, there was a very great culture of even materially advanced knowledge. And uh, one of the first things that was announced by the recently uh, incoming government in India was the uh, the uh, Bharatiya Janata Party government, which is identified with... Hindutva, which is the pro- the promotion of, or Hin- let's just the Hindu party. So one of the first things they said um, was that they want to promote within the schools a knowledge of India's ancient uh, material achievements. That was announced by the Human Resources Minister Smriti. Irani, by the name Irani, it's understood that she's a Parsi, which is uh, not a Hindu. Anyway, uh, <laughs> her husband's a Parsi. So, um, that is a great task, to bring that to light. That's one approach to show that... Uh, they haven't, it's not that they just discovered everything and prior to that everyone was primitive. This is, it's a great struggle to establish that because 
evolutionary theory is so vital to, so central to scientism that any attack on it is is blasphemy and it's taken very seriously. Uh, but actually, evolutionary theory, it's really useless. It's really, it's really a very, very poor theory as is being pointed out in various ways by persons such as the late Richard Thompson and Michael Cremo and many others also. Uh, pointing out, e even using the scientific method of looking at fossils and finding out the dates, it's a very, very poor theory. The idea that, first of all, what drives it? I mean, that, that's another question. One question I would suggested that we put to the scientists is that, uh, oh, I can't remember, but anyway, another another important one is that, well, they say that that uh, natural selection and the, the will, to, the genes and the will to survive. Where does all that come from? What What is it in a collection of chemicals that the chemicals all to get, get together and have a conference and think, we want to remain like this and our offspring should also remain like this and we'll punch out all the other ones. Where does the will to... Why should a collection of chemicals want to propagate itself and survive as a group? Where does that come from? It's it's a it's such a bogus theory, evolutionary theory, and the idea that by by slight, random, genetic modifications, one for the there's some monkey and its brain goes boop 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 boop, and then you have a human brain. It's such a bogus theory. Very weak, very, very weak. And even without studying science, we can understand it. Very, very, very weak theory. Even, even without getting all the probabilities and this and that. Even according to them, the probability that it could have taken place is extremely small. But apart from that, the same point. I am not a bag of chemicals. There's more to exist. There's more to life than a bag of chemicals. Uh, future atheistic romance. A man walks with a girl and says, Oh, the, the fibers within my brain are, are firing in such a way that the, uh, the chemicals are reacting in such that I'm attracted to the chemicals over there in that bag. The, lang the future language of romance. <laughs> At that point we were discussing, just at midday, the evolutionarily speaking, if, if, why should there be men and women? This isn't feminism or masculinism. It's, why should there be, it, it would seem to be much better if, if, if women are the weaker sex, physically and everything, they're, they're a liability, just like they want to send the women to battle now, into the wars, send them into the front lines, but they're a liability for the men. For instance, if they're on the battlefield and they need to pass urine, it's a great disadvantage for a woman because they have to do it in a different way. And, and, uh, and they are... Uh, they're more vulnerable like that, when they're doing it, and when they have their menstruation, and uh, if they they have to lift, uh, they have to run in the battlefield with heavy backpack and heavy, heavy uh, weaponry, and the average woman is less equipped to do so than the average man. So according to evolutionary theory, it would have been much better if, if reproduction would have been asexual, and then we'd all be homosexuals. So why are women created? Uh, they illusory energy, prakriti, purushan prakriti, for bewildering. Pungsastriya mittani bhavametam. It's a, it's a perverse reflection of the love of Radha and Krishna 
is that man and woman are attracted to each other and keep each other in this world. But from the evolutionary point of view, why should there be men and women? There should be just one sex. And as Prabhupada pointed out, that if the monkeys are less advanced species, why are they still going on strong? Plenty of monkeys, maybe not in Croatia, but in many countries of the world, there are plenty of monkeys and they don't, they're not showing any sign of dying out soon. <laughs> in fact, in Delhi, they're considered, there are so many monkeys roaming all over the, the uh, capital area that it's, it's considered a public menace. Now, uh, you can't open your windows and doors and some of them are quite aggressive. So there's evolutionary theory. It's, it's really useless. Really. Uh, but it has to be propped up in the name of science. It's, it's this, maybe the central dogma of scientism, which means that they're not very scientific. After all, if, if one scientist is studying the nature of cells, biological cells, and finds out that they're so, comes to discover they're so complex that the, the possibility of them coming into being by the evolutionary method, he discovers that, and as a result has a conversion from being an atheist to a believer in intelligent design, such as that Michael, how do you pronounce it? Behe, 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 Behe. And he wrote Darwin's Black Box, and he has a new updated version of that. If, if a person with scientific training, by employing the scientific method, comes to seriously doubt the accepted, what's called scientific conclusion, and others also agree with him, then scientists should take that very seriously. But it's, it's a matter of faith that they're attached to a certain way of thinking. And they don't want to change that. So, uh, that's, that's one level we have to defend on. Another level is that they say, well, uh, this is all mythology. You see, how can, how can we believe this? Bible. God created the world in six days and Noah's Ark. And of course, the, uh, Noah's Ark story was, it wasn't anything new when it was written in the Bible. There was even all over that area of the world, there are uh, stories of floods in the Vedic literature also. The whole universe is inundated. Then comes Matsya Avatar. So all over the world there are flood stories. But people say, the atheists would say, well, it's just some mythology dreamed up by primitive people. Uh, that charge may come against Shastra also. Just for instance, Ravana with ten heads. And so, what is this, ten heads? Well, actually, if, even from the scientific view, point of view, even to have one head is quite remarkable. What's, what's going on in the brain? Well, it's very difficult. For, how could a brain come into being by evolutionary? Even one head is remarkable. But the idea of having ten heads, it seems to be to a person educated in the uh, way of thinking that, well, what we see is all there is. Then they'll say, it's just, it's just some fairy stories. But then we find in the same Shastra, there's just like, for instance, in Srimad Bhagavatam, we have, we describe there's the creation that the offspring of Kashyap, with his various wives, he gave birth to all different species of life. And then in the same uh, Kanta of Bhagavatam, there's a description of time from the mo most micro, from the micro level to the macro level. And time as measured by movement. They had a scientific understanding of time. And we'll find in Sanskrit and described in various Shastras, they have names for huge numbers. The, the, the largest, there's, there's, uh, lakh is a hundred thousand, and then koti is a uh, hundred lakhs, and then there's arbud, and it goes 
all the way up to Padma, Maha, Padma, they huge numbers. They, they tend to the power of I don't know, 30, 40, so huge, huge numbers. And how, how could people who are just sitting around fires telling fairy stories have even imagined such numbers? That's something to think about, isn't it? Because when they're, descri- they're describing the uh, cosmos. So, um, yeah, also in the third canto of Bhagavatam, there is a description of the, how the, uh, what in modern language you would say the a particle of semen mixes with the ovum and develops and after, after one week it's like this and after two weeks it's like that and it corresponds to modern gynecological descriptions. How could they know that? When in, only in, very recently in the Western world was this discovered. Although theoretically it could have been discovered at any point in time if anyone had uh, started killing and cutting up women at different stages of pregnancy, uh, even without x-rays. Uh, but, but that same knowledge is in the same canto of Bhagavata. So what was it that Vyasadeva was a schizophrenic who sometimes wrote weird fairy stories and sometimes gave scientific descriptions? <laughs> but it is a challenge. I mean, we can't, okay, show me Ravana. Show me some with ten heads. We may not, but we have to have faith. That's all. That such things can exist and do exist. But it's a challenge if, if we are to propagate uh, Krishna consciousness. Uh, Vedic cosmography itself, is that's a great challenge. Now, um, one argument of the of the uh, atheistic scientists, is that they say, well, you say that Jesus came to save the world, but what is there? There's only this one. T- this planet is just one tiny little planet. So what's the big thing? That, that God created the whole universe with this one tiny little planet, and there are just million, unlimited numbers of planets out there, and He made this one planet in which people they get born, and then they either believe in Jesus or they don't. And what's the point? It, it's why have they made this whole story about Jesus coming to save the world when this Earth is just an insignificant part of the massive universe? Well, the, the Vedic knowledge has an answer for that: that every planet is inhabited. Yes, ya prabha prabha vato jagadanda koti koti shvishesha vasudhadi vibhuti bhinna. In this verse, it's described that every planet has its own specialty, its own atmosphere, its own particular function. So, uh, from the Shastric point of view, we can answer that. There is a challenge that um, of modern astronomy and space travel... They say they're going to different planets, sending probes to Mars and Venus and this and that. And it, uh, they say they went to the moon and they, they saw a desert, although nowadays they, they're giving different descriptions. Now, uh, uh, but it's not the description in Shastra. And, and Srila Prabhupada said, that they, how could they have gone? They say there's, the moon is just a desert. Uh, in Gita, Krishna says, Choshati uh, Sarva Somo Bhutva Rasatma Kaha. He says that uh, he becomes the moon. Or he is the moon, which is the giver of rasa. The, the giver of, this is material rasa. The, it makes vegetables and fruit juicy, which Farmers, they know that. The moonlight gives uh, taste 
to the plants. You can grow uh, vegetables. They discover some system. You grow it just in water, in artificial light. What's that called? They made some name for it. But hydroponic, is it? Yeah. But there's no no flavor in them. <laughs> but the, the vegetables they they become juicy with the with the moonlight. And the moon is, the phases of the moon are essential for understanding when to plant crops, when to transplant. Transplant in rice cultivation is initial planting, then transplantation. Um, so Srila Prabhupada said, how can they, so they, how could they have gone to the moon? The moon is giving life and juice to the vegetables. They said, they say there's no life there. So that is a great uh, challenge for us to establish the uh, Vedic cosmography. Sadar Putaprabhu made some start on that. And now our movement's really on the spot because the uh, temple of the Vedic planetarium is going up and we have to have the Vedic planetarium and we have to explain it. So that was a, one of Srila Prabhupada's programs that he gave to his disciples to establish this Vedic planetarium in a an, in an, uh, spectacular manner with the idea that people from all over the world would come to see it and then we'd have to explain. Well, first of all, we have to study and explain. It's a great, ch- it's a great program because we're going to have to establish the authenticity of Shastra in opposition to the atheistic worldview. Actually, recently there was that case against Bhagavad Gita as it is in Tomsk in Siberia. And it was great. It was a great, great preaching opportunity. But it was misinterpreted that the People who were complaining, they were complaining about Bhagavad Gita. And then in the Indian parliament, different MPs, both BJP and Congress and everyone else, Hindu and non-Hindu, were saying, oh, Bhagavad Gita, this is our Indian heritage, and they can't say anything against it. And then word came from Moscow to Tomsk, you better drop this case, it's just not worth it, the fallout. But the prosecutors were saying, we don't have anything against Bhagavad Gita, but it's this edition Bhagavad Gita as it is, it's sexist, it's, uh, it, it calls the whole modern society demons, it's anti-scientific. Great, great opportunity for preaching. Bhagavad Gita as it is, Srila Prabhupada's message. But fortunately or unfortunately, uh, it, got, it was reinterpreted as being an attack on Bhagavad Gita and stopped in that way. But it was really an attack on, on many of the things which Srila Prabhupada wanted to establish, primarily by the mass distribution of Bhagavad Gita as it is. Uh, and then our movement would have to stand up for what appears to be Srila Prabhupada. Sexism! I don't think our movement was prepared to do that. Would have been great. We'd, we'd advise, we'd, then we would see, are we going to stand up for what Prabhupada says or just try and wriggle out of it or what? Actually, that's another whole seminar, the sexism and from the, uh, from the academic standpoint, Srila Prabhupada's books are sexist and in other ways also not corresponding to what is considered politically correct by people who insist that they are correct. Anyway, there's another great challenge, uh, presenting Vedic cosmology in the light of modern scientific, or what's called scientific, research. Uh, Another reason which uh, was kindly reminded to me by Shisha Prabhu at midday, that one another reason why many people don't have much confidence in scientism uh, is that, is that well, science criticizes religion as, as just being some belief, but science itself is so unreliable. Uh, I've 
several times in my lectures, given the example that at school in biology class I was taught, it was written right there in the book, that the simple biological cells, they're very, very simple organisms, and there's a few things, I can't even remember the names, there's this, and there are a few different factors, there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and you have to learn, make a little diagram, learn all the different things, and then you get your marks. So they're very simple organisms, and soon scientists will be able, able to reproduce them in the laboratory. Uh, then, quite a few years later, I found out that, well, scientists no longer say that. They now say that even the most simple biological cell is extremely complex. And then even much later still, I found out that even at the time I was being taught that in the school, scientists already knew it wasn't true. But they hadn't updated their syllabus yet. So the, the teachers, what they know, is often, even what the teachers are being taught to teach you, is often out of date according to their theories because it takes time to update everything. So it's it's highly unreliable. What was that you were saying? That the, previously it was just taken for granted. That, well, it was taught as a scientific fact that uh, life in the ocean cannot exist more at more than a depth than 200 feet because light can't reach there. But then they found life so much deeper. So it's written just like it's a fact, which is cheating. Because they don't know. They, they, they just, now they've gone there and seen, and then they have to revise their theories of how life can exist without, uh, without light. So in this way, they're always revising their theory. They write, as Srila Prabhupada said, we'll find that in life comes from life. They speak as if they have surety, but they're not sure. I, I also often give this example, another example, but it's a good example that once I saw uh, sitting on a plane, someone was next to me was reading a some scientific propaganda magazine, and this was uh, this must have been about thirty years ago, or something like that. Uh, and in the article, it said that scientists now. Uh, theorize or propose that life arised, arrived on this planet by meteorites and it came from somewhere else. Living organisms came somewhere else. In other words, by their research, they found out that what the, the con that life couldn't have arisen on this planet, so it must have arisen somewhere else and came here by meteorite. Okay, folks, jump on the meteorite. We're going down to the earth. So they start off like this, that, well, scientists now theorize that life arrived by meteorite, and then said, and then the meteorites arrived, and then the organisms reacted with it. They, first of all, they start off with, they suspect or they theorize, and then the rest of the article, it happened like this, and then this happened, and that happened, and everything else happened. So that at the end of reading the article, you're convinced that it's, it's completely scientifically proved that, that Donald Duck arrived on an asteroid, and... Uh, and then life's been going on ever since. Just cheating. The people are taking, oh, science. Fantastic. Oh, what they discovered. What did they discover? What is the scientific proof? Show it. Come on, show, show a meteorite with, with life, living organisms arriving. It's just a total speculation. And you could as well say that, that, that the first living organism was Donald Duck. It's just as, it's just as provable or as anything else. <laughs> After all, Walt Disney, uh, he, he actually had a, a, a hidden mystic message, which Donald Duck, it's not just some, something for entertaining children, but it has a deep spiritual message there. And his message is, go to Disneyland and spend all your money. And he is a great, he was a great believer in modern science. Another rascal. So, uh, one reason that, that, uh, 
Oh, and there are so many others also that life cannot exist uh, above 100 degrees Celsius. So, the, so uh, it's true that by, for instance, pasteurizing Louis Pasteur and Mary Pasteur, your, your milk uh, or your beer or whatever, then it won't have uh, that many germs will be killed. But so they presume that life cannot exist at temperatures above 100 Celsius, boiling point. But then they found organisms <laughs> which, with, with existing in temperatures above that. So pop goes their theory. <laughs> and then they have to, they have to scramble and make a new theory. And it goes, that's history of science. They, they, they make a theory, they discover something. After some time they discover it's wrong. They make a new theory, then they find that's wrong. Then they make a new theory and that's science. It goes on and on and on and on like that. Uh, so Vedic knowledge is, actual knowledge means fixed knowledge. It doesn't change. It's not that we're our, as Srila Prabhupada pointed out, that the fact that they say that we are, we are, we're finding out, we're discovering, it means they don't know. If you knew, you wouldn't have to discover. So the parampara system means someone knows and they teach you. Then you know, then you teach someone else and they know. But if you don't know, it's, then you're just searching in the dark. That's all. Uh, now, one major point, which we can attack scientific atheism on, major point, is that there is reincarnation. And there is actually, even by the scientific method, there is very good evidence of that. Google Ian Stevenson. Of course, scientists don't want to accept it, and they'll say that his methodology wasn't wasn't uh, to the scientific method. But he took great care to do his research in a manner that would be scientifically acceptable. But it seems he himself wasn't aware that, however carefully he did it, it wouldn't be scientifically acceptable because scientists aren't scientific themselves. And they don't want to accept what doesn't fit with their theory. But there is actually, even from the materialistic scientific point of view, there is very good evidence that reincarnation is a fact, which really blows their whole evolutionary theory to pieces and all their, their mundane ideas. Of course, you can still be a you can believe in reincarnation and still be a materialist, like Buddhists, for instance, and uh, most Hindus. And in, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks about that. Veda Vadarata. They believe that we go from body to body, but they think, okay, what's the next body I'm going to enjoy? So it doesn't, uh, in and of itself, overcome the materialistic mentality, but it's certainly what's being promoted as science which is considered the backbone of atheism in the modern age. When Krishna spoke these verses that about uh, the, the demons, asatyam apratishtam te, their, the, their scientific basis was uh, doubt, skepticism, and uh, philosophies such as the atheistic Sankhya philosophy and uh, philosophies similar to Buddhism, predating Buddhism. It wasn't that Buddha... He came up with something entirely new. No one comes up with anything entirely new. Uh, but the uh, predominant force in atheism today is this, so, this scientism, which promotes that we are only matter and that uh, life is not a separate phenomenon. They don't even, they don't even, they don't say that. It's just presumed. They don't, they don't touch that. They're, they're very careful. It's like, it's like, they're afraid to even get into that. What is, 
what is the nature of life. They just want to to say that well, life is life is that which exists when the when there's uh, different conditions, uh, ability to reproduce and breathing and so many different things. But what actually is the nature of life? They they don't want to venture into that. Uh, but reincarnation, if it's accepted that there's reincarnation, then that really explodes all their theories. Um, and although many people throughout the world accept to some extent uh, that there is reincarnation, for instance, most Hindus and Buddhists and many people in the Western world, and even some Christians, I, I can't work out how that is, but apparently some Christians also accept there's reincarnation. I don't see how it fits with Christian dogma. But uh, anyway, some inventive theology. Uh, but even they don't understand either. Uh, they just have some vague idea. And it, it, quite often in India, people ask me about, oh, what happens? How does it work? They don't. They have a very vague idea. There's no spiritual education about this. So that's uh, a major area that we should promote, the science of reincarnation, both among people who do not believe in it and among people who believe in it also. <clears throat> Disbelief in reincarnation that is uh, more prominent in the Western world. That's that's probably got more to do with the culture that developed from Christianity than 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 from science. Modern science grew in within and to a large extent, or to some extent. <laughs> in opposition to the Christian worldview. So they were influenced by that. For instance, there's no particular reason why they should consider time to be linear and not circular, as in the Vedic understanding, that there are cycles of time. Uh, but they just adopted it because they couldn't imagine anything else because that's what came with the Christian worldview. So also the idea that you have one life and that's it, finished, that also came from the Christian worldview. So disbelief in reincarnation might have more to do with just the, the West, Western culture than, than with actual scientific understanding. So I... Uh, spoken all these things over the last three days and probably most of us present here are thinking, well, it's interesting but doesn't really have much to do with what I'm doing in my life. I'm, I'm trying to be Krishna conscious. And, but this is just for uh, devotees who engage in this kind of preaching. Actually, we should all be knowledgeable of this, at least to explain to our children and explain to others. It's at any time when we're in the preaching field, which the preaching field, where's the preaching field? Everywhere. At any time, in any place, people can come up to us and speak so many things. Uh, we, we may think, well, I'll, I'll just go on Harinam and keep the district of Prasadam, but if we're out on Harinam, then people come and they may say so many things. So we have to be ready for that. Uh, so each devotee should know about these things, at least to some extent, and especially those who are out in the preaching field. And also Srila Prabhupada specifically wanted some devotees to specialize in this kind of preaching, in, counter, in countering atheism under the garb of scientific knowledge. So that is one of the uh, important missions of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada was willing to invest large amounts of money and resources into countering 
this uh, Darwinism, which he perceived as being a great obstacle to the spreading of pure theism throughout the world. And we've seen that the that the uh, atheist atheism is becoming more prominent in the world. So our our response as a movement should be more. So far, the argument atheism versus theism has mostly gone on between uh, atheists and Christians, and Muslims have jumped in too. Uh, one contemporary Hindu. Philosopher, ideologue, has written in one book that we don't care what the scientists say. It's got nothing to do with us because you can say whatever you like. But our tradition is one of mysticism, and doesn't you can we we don't have any problem with science. We we're, we're neither for it or against it because anyway we his idea is this impersonal meditation and mystic understanding. But that's not. Uh, that's not our understanding, and, and we are charged to uh, combat that. And Srila Prabhupada wanted that. Unfortunately, it's uh, it is uh, not uh, being given the same importance in our movement today as Srila Prabhupada wanted it to be promoted. So, although. All of this is maybe in some ways not for you. It's not your specialization, but someone out there, some devotees, they should take this up, take it seriously, should be promoted, just like Varnashram. It may not be for everyone to go and live on the land. If you say that, then no one will want to live. Someone should. (laughs) Uh, but, But some devotees should take this very seriously. It is an austerity in many ways to to study science after coming to Krishna consciousness, people who have the sufficient brain power, they want to study Shastra. But it is required. Just like our previous Acharyas, they studied and understood for the sake of refuting the uh, impersonalistic theories of Advaita Vedanta. They had to know them, to defeat them. In Vedic dispu- in disputation, before anyone could dispute with another, first of all, he would have to explain to his opponent what his opponent's philosophy is. And then when the opponent says, yeah, you got it right. And then the the other side would have to explain. And then when they both understood what they're arguing about, then they could argue. Because what we often find is people are arguing but they don't even understand what the other person thinks. And they, they straw man arguments, they say, well, you said this, and they never said it at all. And uh, in this way, the dis- it's useless, such disputation. So we require devotees who take this very seriously. And our movement should take this very seriously. In the Vedic planetarium, it's really going to put us on the spot. What are we going to say? It's Vyasadeva's Alice in Wonder, Vyasadeva's answer to Alice in Wonderland, or what are we going to say? This is this is a fact. This is real. What you are telling us, that's not a proper understanding. This is the proper understanding. Puts us on the spot, no doubt. In the meantime, we all have to go. We should all go on with our. Hainam Sankitan, preaching in various ways, festival programs, book distribution, all these things should go on. All devotees should be concerned with this. This is the uh, the general preaching, which our movement has to do, this general preaching, this specialized preaching. Uh, but we also have to be ready for and face the intellectual challenge. And even if no one comes to fight with us, we should be challenging them. Srila Prabhupada wants us to challenge the atheistic scientists. In this country, we're coming here every year. We have a nice festival. But devotees should be very concerned with uh, all all the other people of Croatia, whatever your country is, how are they going to be saved? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very concerned about all the jivas in the universe. Of course, many of our devotees 
their life is so intense, just if they can hold their Krishna consciousness together and their family together, that's a great achievement in and of itself. But over and above that, we are charged with the responsibility of spreading Krishna consciousness to others. Our movement has gone through some very difficult times and uh, still those difficult times are going on in many ways, but the, the scope and the potential is there. People can take to Krishna consciousness. People are inter- interested. Srila Prabhupada wrote in one letter uh, that people are anxious for these books. They want these books. And at the time I was distributing books, I thought, I, I couldn't understand it because I didn't find people were interested. And in fact, for the Two years or so I was distributing books in England and Ireland before I relocated to India. Uh, I can still remember the one or two people who showed some actual interest in the books. We were just selling them on the George Harrison mantra. It's a great mantra. You've heard of George Harrison, haven't you? And you open the book and show the Krishna book with the signature from George Harrison. He sponsored these books and he gets all his songs from them. And this and that. And you open the pictures and my sweet Lord and this and that. And it was great. People bought the books. But we didn't find people taking interest. But now they're taking interest. Many people are taking interest. There is good interest. Uh, And this country has uh, always been one of the best fields for preaching Krishna consciousness and bringing people to Krishna consciousness. And the potential is still there. So, over to you folks. I sit on a big seat and talk big things, and I go off, and you have to stay here and make things work. Bring people to Krishna consciousness. Okay, that is this seminar on the the challenge of scientism. I now declare it officially over, and if anyone has any questions to prolong it or comments, you may kindly voice them at this juncture in time, which means now. By the way, I'm not a scientist, so don't ask me. As you might have, and as any scientist would know, uh, or even anyone who's studying in a biology class would know, I'm not a scientist. I just read a few things here and there, so don't ask me any. Well, you can ask complex questions if you like, and I'll just tell you I don't know, that's all. I have a question about the incarnation. There is some like pseudo-scientific way of regression in the past life. There is some Hypnotic regression. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know whether it's pseudo or not. Maybe, maybe some, they say that, well, there's suggestion and this and that. Some of, some of it may be, actually some of it does appear to be real. And that's one of the things that Stevenson did with hypnotic regression. And then he'd find out, people would say things about their previous life and then he'd go and check it out. And there would be such details that would not be possible to be known by the person who said it. And and for instance, they'd uh, they'd go to some house and then they'd take them to the house. They'd find some house in another country and they say, yeah, it's just here. And then they go there and they look, oh, what's wrong? The, the door should be here. And then you're thinking, oh, they got it wrong. And then they find out that 20 years ago the, there was a door there and it got covered over. And there, So hypnotic regression in some cases might be bogus, but it seems that they have, hypnotic regression has revealed Uh, cases of past life memories. When we say revealed, we say that um, it would be by far the best explanation. There's there's no other plausible explanation than that the person who is speaking that was that person in a previous life. And when there are hundreds and thousands of such cases, and when there are cultures all over the world that teach of this, then it's a very good case for reincarnation. 
although we we don't promote hypnotic regression as the reason for understanding reincarnation. But if you want to take a, what they call a scientific approach, it's there. And those who subscribe to scientism, atheism in the name of science, they will, they will try to debunk it. But mostly they try to ignore it because it's not highly debunkable. So what are we going to say? I just wanted, I just cut you out there because, as I often do when people are asking questions, because often the premise of the question is flawed, in which case there's no point in going on and asking the question. Devotees learn this technique. What's the point? Why, what do you, just uh, some devotees want to know what they were in their previous life. What's the point? What do you gain? I mean, we already know from Shastra. We, 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 they, 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 I was a dog, I was a cat, I was a butterfly, I was a chimpanzee, I was a giraffe, I was a camel. We already know. What does it matter? People can say, what are you going to be in your next life? Which next life? There's a next life, and out of that, a next life, and a next life, and a next... Why are you so concerned about the next life? In millions and... If you, if you look back from... Go in the future, 70 trillion lives, what's, what's so important about this one? This particular life, or the one after that? But the real thing is not to get another body in this material world. Trying to find out what we were in our previous life and what we are in, in the next life that's actually an extension of the consciousness of what I am now is me. But it's not. So why are we so concerned about our previous life and the next life? We already know from Shastra that, 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 we, that we are not the body and we change from body to body. So why do hypnotic... There are already people doing hypnotic regression. Why should we do it? Hmm. And uh, and of course it can be misused also. That can be misused. Yeah. You mentioned today also like the Brahmastas, but uh, and there was like uh, in the last uh, 120 years different series of attempts from uh, materialists to. Uh, Gain the information, knowledge uh, from the uh, Dhammur Veda, how, how they can invoke such a... Uh... Yeah, demons want to find out how to make Brahmastras. But we find that Arjuna, he had to, in Bhagavatam is described, to invoke the Brahmastra, he had to do Archaman and say mantras. You have, to, you have to have some qualification to do that also. It's not, it's not a totally... It's a subtle material science. The Germans got the idea, is it, from studying Shastra? They were on the verge to make the bomb. Prabhupada said because Hitler didn't do it because he was a gentleman. He didn't want to do it. It's well. I don't know whether it's. I don't know whether it's possible. Uh, demons. They. They. We find in Bhagavatam they have various mystic weapons. Even now, up to the present day, there are tantrics in India and similar kind of people in different parts of the world who can do horrible things to to people by in, invoking lower spirits. Brahmastra, that is the weapon that, that's, uh, as far as I understand, that's invoked from Lord Brahma. He's the deity of that weapon. And the lower spirits, they can also do so many things. You can have a whole village of people going mad under the influence of spirits and so many things. 
But we're not concerned with such things. Maybe there may come a time when, but right now it's not the it's not the necessity for us to start training people. If we could train people to even keep clean according to Vedic standards, that would be a with no idea, no idea. They think if you taking a shower, that's it. Sna- they're stated in Bhagavatam, snanam eva prasadhanam. People think just by taking a shower they clean. No idea whatsoever. Now there's the idea in our society for brahminical initiation that they should take some tests in Shastra, but they should also, also there should be training in brahminical culture. Anyway, that's another point altogether. Yeah, there's a hand going up. Oh, give, please give the mic over here. To, this way. Someone may ask, uh, if you preach against scientism, why do you use the modern scientific uh, um, discoveries and uh, medical Google? A jagar of Riti. The, the, the python sits in one place and whatever comes, it takes it, takes advantage. It doesn't, it, the python doesn't himself make any endeavor to uh, search for food, but when food comes, he takes it. Srila Prabhupada used this example. So all these scientific discoveries, that, so we shall use, we're living in this world, and we shall use what they have for spreading Krishna consciousness. But actually, we want to establish communities in which people will live very simply, with no electricity, and just live very, very simply and depend on the land, the cows, and Krishna, which is, that's real civilization. No electricity, no cut out of the money system. That's the biggest revolution. <laughs> Don't get caught in their money by which they manipulate you. So we don't rely on these things. We can use them. You're using them for propagating demonism. We should use them for promoting Krishna consciousness. That's all. But we're not going to, we're not going to study how to make a better microphone. Let someone do that. Then we shall use it. Now is the time for mass propagation of Krishna consciousness. Priti vite ache jato nagaradi gram. Savratra prachahoi be moranam. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted Krishna consciousness spread all over the world. Previously, there were small groups of Vaishnavas and the gurus would teach to a small number of people. Now is the time for spreading Krishna consciousness worldwide. So we should use whatever means are necessary for that. If Srila Prabhupada had just sat in Vrindavan, then Krishna consciousness wouldn't have spread all over the world. But he came out, and now it is spread. So we're using these things, but we're not dependent on them. We shouldn't overuse them. That light in that bathroom has been on all through this lecture, and I doubt if someone's been in the bathroom all that time. We should turn off lights. It's another thing which, by the way, Srila Prabhupada was insistent on. Leaving lights on, leaving fans on when there's no one there in the room. Wasting money, Krishna's energy. So we can use it, but we're not dependent on it. And we, we want to establish a culture where real culture can prosper better without all these things, actually. We can use it. Mass book distribution is possible thanks to the various factors, the printing press, of course, being one of them. Laptop computers are very useful for writing books and so many other things. Storing uh, sound files of lectures and but you can live without it. I've been living without my laptop for the last few weeks because it's broken down. And I'm not able to... I'm moving around too fast to get it repaired. 
So, I mean, life goes on. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have a nervous breakdown yet. But I haven't been able to do my writing, but there are other I can do other things. Now, now, nowadays, you're going to write books. It doesn't make sense to do it by the old system. You practically the old system of printing is. You, you have to give a computer file for printing. Who's going to print? The, the old system is that you give, a, you give a typed manuscript, which that also requires a typewriter, and then, the, uh, then it was hand typeset, and after that came uh, typo, linotype, and then after that came photos, I can't remember, I used to do all this, and then... then Nowadays, you just give the PDF file and they just print it. I, I'm not sure. How, I'm out of touch with printing. But uh, it wouldn't make any sense to... Anyway, no, no, one, would ta- no one would take a, even a hand-typed manuscript. No printer would take it. What to speak of a handwritten manuscript? It has to be done by... And, and the tools are there. They're very useful for editing and everything and so on. It's there, we can use it. If it's not there, well, life will go on. We will do what we're doing. The great works of the Goswamis, they, they made their works without any Veda base. Now the, their works are in the Veda base. And we can take advantage of it. They've developed this culture for sense gratification, and we can use it for Krishna consciousness. Hmm. Yeah, there's a question there. Uh, I have a comment. It's small, short comment. Maybe the other is a question. All right, if it's a short comment, make Please. it short, because there's only, yes. only four minutes if we're going to be on to. Uh, maybe I missed during your classes the last three days. Uh, three years ago, I had the uh, information that. Uh, I read actually that official science announced that one of the planets of the solar system. Oh, Pluto got deplanetized. <laughs> it's not anymore. Yeah, it's not considered. They discovered it and then now it's undiscovered. Or For the seven it's, years, it's demoted to the status of a non planet <laughs> because it's not really what doesn't fit the definition of a planet. It's, it's not big enough and it's not solid enough. So Plu- Pluto and what happened with Neptune? Still a planet. So Pluto and Neptune are the new planets they discovered, but Pluto's been demoted to just an, another asteroid now. Sorry, Pluto. Yeah. That's scientific progress. You discover something, and then you discover it's wrong, and then you discover something else which is right. And after some time, you discover it's wrong, and then you discover something else which is right, and you discover that's wrong, and then you go on. It's called called progress. Da, 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 da. Yeah, okay. Here the Shiva Prophet has a vision regarding the progress of the science. <laughs> he claimed that naturalistic scientists will never be able to prove that life came from matter. Side, he said that the naturalist scientists will be able to count, for example, the raindrop number of snowflakes or. Sci- Prabhupada said that the scientists will be able to count the number of raindrops? I don't think even the scientists themselves are saying that. They've estimated the number of atoms in the universe. Someone's done, but so what? Should we believe them? There are certain axioms accepted in science. For instance, that the laws which they discover 
are applicable in all times, places, and circumstances. Not provable. How do you know if you go a few billion light years away that the laws of the laws of physics will operate in the same way? Anyway, there are so many things. There are interpretations of quantum theory with multiple universes going on simultaneously. Every event and at every at every nanosecond there are unlimited number of events going on, and they all produce, again, unlimited numbers of events. These are some of the weird things that come out of the interpretations of quantum theory. So, I wouldn't... Uh... This, this thing, by the way, that they, they're always saying that the scientists are producing life. What that, They said that when Prabhupada was present with their test tube babies, where Prabhupada pointed out they're not producing life. They're just taking an already fertilized uh, egg and putting it in a test tube. They're not creating life. So they're always saying they're going to manipulate the DNA and all this and the genes, but they're cloning, but they're not creating life. They're, they're fiddling around with it. <laughs> hmm? Copy and paste, yeah. And maybe do a little Photoshop on the way also. <laughs> How can we, by using scientific methods, prove the existence of God? Ask the devotees who know about science. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. If I was, I'd maybe be doing that. I began this seminar by reading Srila Prabhupada's translation to and purport of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16, text 8. And I'll now read the beginning of the purport by Srila Prabhupada to the verse after that. It really uh, summarizes the attitudes and the activities of the demoniac scientists. <clears throat> Although Srila Prabhupada doesn't specifically mention scientists herein. Srila Prabhupada writes, The demoniac are engaged in activities that will lead the world to destruction. The Lord states here that they are less intelligent. The materialists who have no concept of God think that they are advancing. But according to Bhagavad Gita, they are unintelligent and devoid of all sense. They try to enjoy this material world to the utmost limit and therefore always engage in inventing something for sense gratification. Such materialistic inventions are considered to be advancement of human civilization, but the result is that people grow more and more violent and more and more cruel, cruel to animals and cruel to other human beings. Uh, I've finished the quote there. Just see how relevant this is. Uh, they're leading the world to destruction. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, in this very purport here, he, uh, he brings the purport to the conclusion by saying, by talking about the atomic weapons that uh, the scientists are inventing. Uh, Srila Prabhupada writes about what they consider to be advancement because they're always making materialistic, more and more inventions that are meant for their sense gratification. But for all they talk about advancing, their, their consciousness is so 
bad and it's, it's getting worse and worse that they're just becoming more and more cruel. Therefore, they're, even though they appear to be very intelligent and in some ways they can be called intelligent, really they're devoid of all sense because all their activities simply result in uh, frustration. Uh, now, another point I, I'd made, and I'll elaborate on that a bit more now, is that Richard Dawkins talks about the God of the gaps. In other words, his idea is that as long as people can't explain something scientifically, they say, well, it must be God. The rain is sent by God. Now we know that rain is caused by uh, various uh, interactions of the of physical uh, elements, and there's no God there. That's what they say. Uh, we say that God created the world. We don't need God to explain that. That's what they say. We can explain it by saying that uh, there was a big bang. And we don't know how it happened, but anyway, that's good enough explanation to throw out God, to, to throw out God according to them. Uh, so they talk about the God of the gaps and that anything you can't explain, just say it must be God. But that's being superseded now by science. And whatever we don't know, we shall know in future. Uh, now, as I'd stated, there'll always be gaps. They can never understand everything. But actually, they they have the science of the, of the gaps also. They're always purportedly filling in gaps with so-called scientific explanations. But then later they find out the explanation doesn't work, especially in the, in the field, um, most importantly, in the field of explaining what is life. They, they cannot scientifically, or what they call science, they cannot explain what is life. Uh, so they're always, they, they become excited from time to time, thinking that now we found out what is life. We did it. We're already just on the verge of it. They thought that, or they not only thought, but they propagated that the essence of life will be uh, discovered when they discovered cells, and then they thought, now we'll investigate some more and we'll find out that that uh, life can be defined in terms of cells. Well, it didn't work. Then they then they thought enzymes, then proteins, which are another. Well, enzymes are a kind of protein. Then genes. Now we now we discovered about genes, and by by uh, explaining and discovering more about genes, then we'll be able to say exactly what life is. But that be, that they discovered to be futile as they discovered more and more. Now the great uh, undiscovered field, the last frontier, they say, ha, 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 as if they've actually reached the last frontier in science. <laughs> They're so brashly overconfident. Uh, they say the last frontier is the study of the brain, the mysteries of the brain. And in the brain we will find the secret of life. And it will go on like this. They'll find that the secret of life is not in the brain, and then they'll ascribe it to something else, then something else, some something else. This is the science of the gaps. Hare Krishna.